very short series of talks on um, an introduction to the four books. Um, before I begin, I'd very much like to thank um, the Provost, Venerable Shen Miao, um, for giving us this wonderful learning opportunity. I'd also very much like to acknowledge and thank uh, Venerable Master, the Academy, um, the University, all of our teachers uh, in, in the UK, um, in Taiwan, Hong Kong, mainland China, and of course, all our friends and our parents, because without all of you, we would not be here today. The um, lectures that um, we're providing um, over the series of weeks um, is very much based on um, the lecture series that Professor Zhang Tingquan gave to the Academy. Um, so uh, for those of you who might have seen this before in Chinese, um, some of the PowerPoints might be familiar. Now his lectures are um, based on the interpretations by Professor Li Bingnan, an eminent um, Buddhist and Confucian scholar in Taiwan. As we all know, um, the lifelong learning that is Confucian cultivation um, is everlasting and we there's always so much more to learn. So um, Kelly and I truly appreciate um, if you could put your comments and your feedback into the chat box. Um, as with questions, we would also welcome all your questions. Also put these in the chat box. Um, and what we'll try to do is we'll try to address these questions as part of um, next week's talk. Um, the reason being is that we want to keep the sessions to one hour um, and not take up too much of your Sunday. So um, please um, make use of the chat box function. Now, today, what I'll cover is the history of the four books as well as a brief um, summary of Confucius himself. And then the following weeks will be focused on each of these texts. So the highest learning, the analects, the mentis, and the practice of the mean. Um, you'll notice, of course, that the translations of these titles um, may be different from what you're used to. For example, Da Xue can also be called or translated as the great learning. Um, so I'd like to quickly um, make a note about um, the translations on these slides. Um, what you see on these slides are modifications of published translations. Um, anyone who's done any translating will know that um, it's very much based on an interpretation. So there's no one size fits all. Um, the translations that you see on the slides uh, not the gold standard, nor are they the guide to translation, but really you could say they're a work in progress. Now, as you know, all of these texts, the four books are written in literary Chinese. Um, so um, you'll see the tra English translations. And what I'll try to do is that I'll take um, my time um, in introducing these Chinese terms in English. Um, so that, you know, we really start from level zero. So if you've, um, you know, not, you're not really familiar with the four books, that's completely fine. So the first question, of course, is why do we need to learn the four books? And I think for most of us, we would have um, started our exploration of traditional Chinese culture and um, Confucianism. Um, through this very short book, the guidelines for being a good person, the Di Zi Gui. Um, and, you know, the moment you open this text, um, you see this short outline. And this short outline is very interesting because it um, provides us with an order to learning, starting from the family through to the community. Um, and it's interesting because each of the key words here in this outline um, then goes on to become the headings in the seven chapters of this book. So, for example, uh, being cautious, being trustworthy. But where does this outline come from? Well, actually, um, 
this outlined is one of the sayings of Confucius as recorded in the Analects. Um, if you look at the English translation, it's slightly different, but in fact, the Chinese is almost identical. And so you could say that the Di Zigui is really an elaboration of this particular passage in the Analects. And in fact, um, the primers, so elementary texts that were read in pre-modern China were actually stepping stones to the four books. Um, and the four books themselves are really a springboard to the greater classical tradition, um, like the 13 classics or other Confucian writings. And so if we think about it, in fact, the primers that like Deeds of Way, um, after we've learned that, it's a logical progression to then learn the four books. Now, some of you may also say, well, the Deeds of Way is quite short, um, but I haven't been able to fully practice all of its teachings yet. Um, and does that mean that I shouldn't move on to another text? As it says in the Deeds of Way, we should try to finish one book first before moving on to another. Well, I guess the most important question then is, well, why is it that we're not able to practice what's in the Deeds of Way? And Confucius would probably reply that it's because of our understanding. Do we know what the outcome of our practice looks like? So if we read the very first sentence in the Analects, it tells us that the more we study, the more happier our life should be. Are we experiencing that? Do we understand the details of how to practice? Do we know why we should be doing these things? And so if we're lacking knowledge in any of these aspects, it makes it very difficult to actually put it into practice. And what we find is that we often relapse and go back to our old habits. Um, so even after years of really trying to cultivate, um, you really still aren't able to fully put into practice all the teachings. And that's where the four books and the greater classical tradition comes in because it's through the four books that we get that comprehensive understanding of the theory. Why do we have to do this? Um, and on top of that, we get the examples, the, the models. Um, the Analects is the recorded words and sayings of Confucius himself. Um, Mencius, uh, the text is really um, about the second sage, Mencius. So, you know, we really, come to understand the life of these two great sages, Confucius and Mencius. And it's through these works that we can really be inspired. Um, look at how they did it. What did they say? How did they do it? And really be able to emulate them. And then we can come back to the deeds of way and say, well, actually, this is how I can do this now. So the four books um, shouldn't be seen as something separate from the Deeds of Way and our practice of the teachings, but rather a supplement. Um, they help us in our understanding to be able to fully practice what we need to do. We often know what we need to do, we just don't seem to do it at the right moment. So um, that's where the further study and the further knowledge comes in. Now, when we think about the four books, we really uh, should go back to their origins, the source of the four books, which is Confucius himself. What was he thinking when he said this, for example? What was his life like? Confucianism um, is, of course, a Western term, um, and it very much acknowledges Confucius as the founder. But Confucius, this particular, his name, um, is actually a Latinized version of um, the Chinese Kong Fuzi. Uh, Kong is his surname. Um, Fuzi is not his first name, but rather a respectful term of address for teachers in pre-modern China. So Kong Fuzi, um, literally translated into English, means Master Kong. And that's what we say when we say Confucius. So who was Confucius? In one sentence, Confucius was the first Chinese thinker to articulate a system of thought and ethical teachings 
about the good life in Chinese, the Dao or the way. I'd like to now use the words of two very eminent American sinologists, um, Henry Rosemont Jr. and Roger Ames, um, and to use their words to help you understand how people might see Confucius today. So um, these two sinologists are particularly um, renowned because they together have translated the Analects and the classic of family reverence, the Xiao Jing, but they are also experts in early Confucian thought. So this is what they have to say. Confucius is arguably the most influential philosopher in human history. Now, there's two things about this first sentence um, that I'd like to point out. The first is that they say Confucius is, not was. So he is arguably the most influential philosopher. And why is that? Because Chinese studies, or Confucian thought is still being studied around the world today, um, whether it's in all the major universities around the world or even educational institutes that are not associated with universities. So he continues to be um, very influential. The other thing to note is that they use the term human history rather than Chinese history. Um, and that's interesting. Um, because as some of you would know, um, from even as early as around the third century, um, Confucian thought through the classics um, spread to other parts of Asia, for example, the Kingdom of Korea, Vietnam, and later Japan. But importantly, Confucius himself advocated that these teachings uh, should be universally accessible, that they are in fact um, the cultural heritage of all humanity. They continue by saying that he's celebrated as China's first teacher, both chronologically and in importance. His ideas have been the rich soil in which the Chinese cultural tradition has grown and flourished. And I think what's really interesting here is that they use the term his ideas because Confucius himself was very modest. He said that he didn't create any sort of traditional culture, but rather transmitted it. And his contribution was to impart past wisdom. So um, it's because of his contributions um, in ensuring that this past wisdom was transmitted um, that we are today able to tap into the intellectual wealth of the ancient thinkers. And Confucius, what he did was really look back in time at the rulers of high antiquity, um, so-called sage rulers. Um, Confucius looking back in time is sort of like us today looking back at Confucius 2000 years ago. Um, and he was able to bring together their teachings um, and articulate a system of thought um, that could be passed down to future generations. And these thoughts, these teachings, cover some of the most basic and enduring aspects of the human experience, family, friends, community. And it's his work in doing this um, that we celebrate to this day. So in China to this day, Confucius is celebrated as the greatest teacher and the greatest sage of all time. They continue by saying, in fact, whatever we might mean by Chineseness today, some two and a half millennia after his death, is inseparable from the example of personal excellence that Confucius provided for posterity. Now, what's particularly impressed upon us here is Confucius's personal example. He didn't simply teach, he was also able to put these teachings into practice. He walked the talk. And it's his lived example that inspired people during his time, but also continues to inspire people today. So what was Confucius's life like? What I'm going to do now is provide you with a very short summary of Confucius's um, life. And this is taken from one of the earliest biographies that we have today about Confucius, written by Sima Qian um, in the first century 
BCE. So what we know from Sima Tian is that Confucius's ancestors um, were part of or came from a once illustrious family in the state of Song. And um, after they lost their political standing, his grandfather migrated to the state of Lu, where his father was a prefect, uh, an official, in a small town near the capital. And this is where Confucius was born in the sixth century BCE. And interestingly, around this time in the world, other major thought leaders also appeared. So for example, Plato in ancient Greece, or the Buddha in ancient India. So Confucius was born in the year 551 BCE. First thing that people noticed was that he had an interesting hill-shaped forehead. And because of this, he was given the personal name Tiu, which literally means hillock. Um, his formal name, which uh, he received at the age of 20, um, was Zhongni, and this is the name that most people would have addressed him by um, as an adult. And that literally means the second son and Mount Ni, which is where, um, as you can see in this painting, his mother is praying for her child. Now, these paintings um, date back to the Ming Dynasty, so around the 15th century, and uh, they're based on the life and times of Confucius. So other than this very interesting physical feature of Confucius. Um, Confucius was very different from other children. When he was young, he enjoyed playing with sort of make-believe um, ceremonies. So he'd have these ritual vessels and he'd sort of set it out as if he was conducting um, an ancient ceremony, um, like how um, we know about commemorating our ancestors, etc. Um, and no one taught him this, uh, but he was able to do so, which really foreshadows um, his later career as being a master of these um, ritual uh, etiquette, um, but also his great interest in ancient traditions um, and also his understanding of um, these different ceremonies. So that's certainly very interesting. Now, after, so, uh, shortly after he was born, Confucius's father passed away and he was raised by his mother. Being a single parent in modern day society is very difficult, but it was even more difficult in those days. So Confucius is very candid when he talks about his background. He says he comes from a poor and lowly background. Um, and because of this, um, he's not able to enter government service as easily as others, uh, other boys from, um, you know, more prominent families. So what he does at the beginning of his life is um, work in several minor roles. So one of these is being the keeper of the granaries. Now, in this job, he has to record the supply and the output of the millet and wheat that comes in from the tax collectors for a particular noble family of the state. Now, you can probably imagine that someone in his position could easily have fudged the figures um, and kept, you know, pocketed some of the grain for themselves um, and, and sold it. But Confucius was noted to be honest um, and very accurate. He was then promoted to become leader or keeper of the livestock. Um, so grain was a commodity, but livestock was an even more expensive commodity in those days, um, being used for transport and farming. So um, in this particular role, um, it was noted that the livestock flourished under Confucius's care. So from this short account, we can already start to realize that Confucius is someone who's very honest, who's very responsible. But more than this, we get the feeling that, you know, Confucius is someone like us. He has to, you know, work from the bottom. Um, he has to work hard. And in particular, um, it's these experiences during his early life that makes him really identify with and empathise with the common people, the public. He understands how they feel because he also has come from a common background. So um, Sima Tian also writes that Confucius, as a young person, was an avid learner. Um, he'd learn from anyone. And um, he, in 
one of the accounts, he travels to the state of Joel to learn about um, the ancient rituals and ceremonies. And there he meets and visits um, the old master Lao Tzu, um, who's, you know, the Tao Te Ching, um, one of the great classics, is traditionally attributed to Lao Tzu. Um, and he learns about the ancient rituals from Lao Tzu as well. Now, Lao Tzu is uh, the state archivist. So in those days, it was difficult to have an education to be literate, but it was even more difficult to get access to these texts. So Lao Tzu being the state archivist would have had very broad learning. Um, and you know we can see Confucius really um, learning from great teachers, um, but also at this time you can see his enthusiasm for um, these traditions and sort of realizes that, well, in the past, these great sages used these traditions um, to bring about periods of great peace and prosperity. And he starts to think, well, we should implement that in today's society to help improve the lives of the people. But he knows, of course, that in order to do that, he has to um, be part of the government. He has to influence the leaders. So, um, you know, already during this time, um, he's developed a reputation for being um, someone who's very erudite. He starts to um, have his own students. Um, but it's only when he's in his 50s that his political career really takes off. Um, and this begins when he's appointed as a steward of uh, um, one of the cities uh, called Zhongdu. Um, Confucius, after one year of administration, makes the city a model city. So he's already started to put into practice these ancient traditions, and it actually works. So um, from this, he's promoted to become the Minister of Works, so being or supervising all of the public construction and provisioning. And then um, later, he uh, gets promoted to be the Minister of Justice. Now, during this time, um, he is um, asked to accompany um, one of the, the Duke of Law um, to attend a peace conference with their counterpart, the Duke of Qi. And uh, whilst it's called a peace conference, um, the state of Qi has other ideas. Um, they want to ultimately harm the Duke. So what they do is, you know, the dancers come out, but actually they're brandishing swords. Um, and Confucius, with his broad learning, cites the ancient precedents and ritual etiquette and staves off disaster for his leader. Um, the Duke of Ti realizes that his plot is exposed um, and he loses face. So he um, offers um, land that he previously stole from Lu, um, returns it basically um, as a show of, um, as an apology. And so Confucius, not having raised an army, has reclaimed um, land um, for the state and extended the territory of the state. Now, coming back um, home from this diplomatic success, um, he finds that the three most powerful families in the state are constructing walled fortifications around their territory as a show of their power. Um, now, based on Confucius's advice, the Duke orders that these ward fortifications be demolished. Oh, what um, then results is internal conflict and ultimately the policy fails. Now this actually goes to show that really during this time in Chinese history called the spring and autumn period, and here's a, a sort of a very rough map of the time, um, each of these names refer to the different sort of feudal states. There's the state of law, in the state of tea. Um, but during this time um, in the spring autumn period, um, you see that there's a lot of sort of conflict between the states. Uh, each state wants to increase their power, economic and military resources. They want to try to swallow up their weaker neighbors um, and to increase their territories. So there's a lot of interstate warfare. But also, as we saw with um, what happened to Confucius is that within the states themselves, there is a lot of internal 
um, conflict because the powerful families also want to exert and monopolize the power. Um, so it's a time of great tension um, and the people are really suffering. Um, amongst all this war, um, the quality of life is very poor. Now Confucius at this time um, is the Minister of Justice, but also he takes on more senior responsibilities um, as the Grand Counselor, which is one of the highest executive functions or offices in the state. Um, and through his administration, the state of Lu, it's recorded, uh, becomes more prosperous and the people's lives improve. And for example, um, Sima Tian writes that the meat merchants no longer um, cheat their customers. Uh, there's people um, abide by ritual propriety and uh, no one takes lost property as their own. And so, you know, visitors to the state are also very impressed, but the state of Qi, as you can see here, the neighboring state um, becomes increasingly threatened. They think that if the state of law under Confucius is more powerful, then um, they would be swallowed up. So what do they do? They think of a way to cause division between Confucius and the Duke. So they, they select some of the most, I think 80 of the most beautiful dancers and over a hundred of the finest horses and send it to the state of law as a gift for the Duke. Now, once it's accepted, the no court is held for three days. And, you know, during this time, of course, Confucius realizes that there's no political will to implement his vision of a benevolent government ruled by moral leadership. Um, and of course, during this time, um, because of the failed policy of raising the ward fortifications, um, he's made an enemy of these families. So um, he decides to leave. But he can't leave immediately because then that would expose the faults of his leader. So he tries to find a sort of minor excuse. Um, what he does is, you know, during the annual sacrifices, offerings, the sacrificial offerings are meant to be distributed to the various ministers. But this time it doesn't happen. So Confucius doesn't receive the offerings. Um, and he uses that as a minor excuse to ultimately leave the state along with um, some of his students. And there begins a very long journey throughout the various states of the Chinese kingdom. And this takes 14 years. At every state that Confucius visits, he tries to influence the state leaders. He tries to convince them that there is a better kind of government, a government that's based on these ancient rulers, these ancient traditions that help um, the lives of the people. Now, despite meeting with some of the most powerful political figures during the time, for various reasons, his advice is never really implemented, but he never gives up. And obviously, uh, as you would know, travel during this time would be very difficult, not only because of the, um, the interstate warfare, but also because of the lack of technology. So um, in many instances, we read of Confucius's hardship. For example, he was ambushed by a military officer. Um, he was then also entrapped um, by you know, a mob and almost um, his life was threatened. And then later, when he's um, traveling between Chen and Cai, these two states here, um, he also becomes besieged. And during this time, the provisions run out. So um, it's recorded that his students become, became so weak that they couldn't stand up. But throughout the whole time, Confucius remains calm. He remains devoted and dedicated to his mission. Now, despite all of these difficulties um, and you know, the very long travel, after 14 years, Confucius ultimately decides to return back to the state of Lu, back home. And there, um, the Duke, 
Um, he's very much recognised as an elder, as a man of great erudition. Um, so uh, we read in the Analects and other texts that the Duke, um, as well as the other nobles, do consult him for advice. But really, Confucius devotes the latter years of his life to teaching, and you know his students multiply. Um, but also, he devotes his life to editing and compiling texts. And um, these texts uh, were traditionally um, thought to be, you know, transmitted throughout the generations um, and considered great classics. Now, um, in his early 70s, Confucius ultimately passes away um, in the year of 479 BCE. But the story doesn't end there because his students then go on to become masters themselves, and they have their students um, and continue the legacy of their teacher. So um, there are many uh, lineages of his students, um, but in terms of the four books, um, the traditional view is that the Analects was compiled by Confucius's students and their students. The highest learning was um, compiled by Zeng Zi, who was Confucius's prominent student. Um, the practice of the mean was recorded by Zi Si, who was the grandson of Confucius, but also the student of Zeng Zi. And it's thought that Mencius was taught by Zi Si or one of his students. Um, so you can see uh, very interestingly, this sort of various generations of Confucius's students um, through these four texts. Now, from the time that Confucius passes away to the birth of Mencius, about a hundred years have passed. But Mencius continues to develop the tradition. And this is what he has to say about Confucius. He says, ever since humans came to this world, there has never been one greater than Confucius. So um, Mencius very much defended and developed the tradition. And over a hundred years after Mencius passes away, Emperor Wu of the Han Dynasty decrees Confucian thought as the state ideology in the year 136 BCE. And this was to become the imperial ideology for much of um, the, the rest of imperial China uh, for the next 2000 years. Um, and as part of that, um, the emperor establishes official positions in government um, for the instruction of five classics, so five texts that are associated with Confucius. Um, the Imperial Academy, the highest educational institute, is also founded um, to enable study and transmission of these classics. But more importantly, anyone who wants to be part of the government needs to be able to interpret, to explain um, these five classics. So the five classics are the changes, the documents, the odes, the spring and autumn annals, and the ceremonial rituals. And these texts were so important that they were standardized and inscribed in stone. I mean, these sort of uh, stone inscriptions were placed at the entrance of the Imperial Academy. So um, during this time, um, Confucius is very much revered. And at the end of Sima Tian's biography, um, uh, this is what he says. Uh, so he, he quotes from the Odes. He says, a tall mountain, one looks up to it. So, you know, Confucius is so highly revered. A broad road, one travels forth on it. Someone that we can really emulate and follow the footsteps of. He says, though I cannot reach the heights, my heart leaps up to it. So in trying to sort of emulate and, and really um, praise Confucius. He says, the world has known many rulers and worthy officials who are famous in their own time, but nothing once they died. Confucius was a lowly commoner, but after more than 20 generations, so this is around the year of um, the first century BCE, um, he's still remembered and revered by all who are cultivated. So who are these people? Well, everyone from the emperor, the kings, down to the common people, um, everyone in the central states or in the Chinese kingdom at the time. When they speak of the six arts, the you know, 
um, the subjects um, of cultivation, um, they take Confucius as the standard of perfection. And he's rightly called the ultimate, or you could say even the utmost sage. So this was already um, at that time. And what we see, of course, is, you know, we've talked about Confucius um, as his life, how he lived, struggles. And then um, now uh, what we see is that Confucius, um, after he passes away, his dream is re realized because um, for once the government um, is really taking into account and learning from the ancient thinkers, the ancient sages, and making it a part of their political thought. And this is exactly what Confucius um, had been advocating. Um, so going from Confucius to these texts um, is quite a big change. Um, and in particular, the idea that these five texts could hold so much power and significance um, sometimes is surprising for us in modern day. But if we take a step back um, and think about, you know, what this, this canon, these set of texts that were so revered, um, what made them so revered? Um, we can look around at other parts of the world, other civilizations. And we realize that many other civilizations around the world have also identified a text or a set of texts that are authoritative, that contain timeless principles, that have authority. And these are known as a canon, wisdom literature, um, a sacred text, or simply a classic. Um, so here um, on the right is a photo of a page from um, the Homeric poem, the Iliad, um, which was very uh, important for the Greek civilization. I wonder if you can think of any other canons. Um, of course, we have the Vedas for Hinduism, um, the Quran for the Islams, and also the Holy Bible has been very significant in Western civilization. Yeah. So for the Chinese, the earliest canon was the five classics. But what makes a classic a classic um, from the Chinese perspective? So we can look at the term classic in Chinese and think about it from two perspectives. It's sound and it's form. So in terms of its sound, jing sounds a lot like jing, which means a straight path. And that's why the earliest early Confucian philosopher Xunzi, um, stated that these classics provided direct access, a straight path to the thoughts of the sages. He also explains that um, because the straight path also um, conveys a sense of passing through, these, the content of these texts is such that it passes through or withstands the test of time. So that's one idea of the classic. The other way is to look at the form of the character. So here I've provided um, an ancient form of the character. You can see it's made out of two parts, the left and the right. On the left side is the character for silk, so yarns of silk. And it's meant to represent what you can see in the photo here, um, yarns of silk. And if you look at the earliest um, etymological Chinese dictionary, the Shuo Wen Jiezi, um, this character meant weaving, and in particular, warp threads and weaving. Now, what are the warp threads? Well, in this photo, you can see um, that on this piece of fabric, there are these long white, uh, longitudinal white lines, right? These are the warp threads. In the photo, the lady is threading through horizontal thread, which is called the weft threads. So the warp and the weft together make up the fabric. What's special about the warp threads is that they are spun first um, and they remain constant whilst the other threads are passed through. And so that's why this particular character, Jing, um, also has this connotation of a constant principle. Um, so constant principles that underlie human society and the cosmos. Now, during the 
um, Han period, so during the time of uh, emperor or of Han dynasty, classical masters actually um, thought about five criteria by which they could judge a classic. So, sorry. And these criteria are, first of all, order. So the classic had to represent a very um, comprehensive system of thought in which um, moral questions could be put to it and answered. So that's order, accessible, um, easy to know, easy to follow, relevant. Um, although we live in changing times, um, the classics are relevant for every generation. Fourth, like Shunz that said, um, these texts are meant to provide us with an direct access to the exemplars of the past, the ancient sages. And finally, they have to be enjoyable because it doesn't matter how good they are, it would mean nothing if we can't get past the first page. So um, they have to be enjoyable on a literary level, so they're well written, but also on an ethical level, they have to inspire us to really want to emulate these exemplars. And you get a sense of this when you read a quote from um, the Song Dynasty or 11th century philosopher Cheng Yi. And he says that during his teenage years, he had already studied and understood the Analects. So the Analects is later becomes one of the classics. And however, the more he read it, he realized it had profound implications. So it tells us, of course, that he continued to read the Analects um, even after his teenage years. So I wonder how many of us continue to read books that we read in high school. Um, there's probably not many texts that fit that criteria, but the classics certainly are. They want us to keep reading them. The, the more we read, the more we want to read them. And the other thing is that it, we can see that throughout his life, the various stages of his life, he was able to um, glean lessons and guidance from these texts. So he says it realized it had profound implications. So um, you can see obviously that the five criteria can be used to um, understand and judge other texts and other texts could also fulfill this criteria. So that's exactly what happened. So the original set of five classics became expanded to 13 classics by the 12th century. Now, how do these 13 classics then um, relate to the four books, um, which is where we want what we want to understand. In fact, the four books are part of the 13 classics. As you can see, the Analects and the Mencius uh, are there, but the practice of the mean and the highest learning were originally chapters in the records of ritual. So they were very well integrated. Um, but it was only in 1190 that the philosopher Zhu Xi um, selected these four texts and published them as one, as a set of four um, with his commentaries for the first time. Now, why did he do that? Jusi states here that all things in the world have principle. So this underlying order, constant and timeless principles, but its essence is embodied in the works of the sages and worthy. So these classics for brevity, accessibility, simplicity and practicality, these four books are unsurpassed. So Jorsey felt that he had found a subset of the classics um, that could be a core curriculum that should be read first. Um, they were the foundation um, and they were much more um, easy to understand. So it could reach a broader audience and that's why he selected them. Now, Jorsey believed in these texts so much that he devoted the last 40 years of his life to um, reworking his commentaries, these explanations to the text. Um, and according to his biography, the last three days before he passed away, he was still revising his commentary to the great learning, the highest learning. So um, Jorsey really um, put his life into creating these commentaries. In particular, he felt that these texts very much linked us back to the sage and the various generations of students as we've previously discussed. Now, 
Chaucer's vision was realized on a national level when in 1313, the government decreed that these four books should be the core curriculum for the civil service examinations. So the civil service examinations were a series of exams um, that began in the sixth century. Um, and that meant that literally anyone from um, the empire could become part of the government. It was a true meritocracy. So um, as part of these exams, they had um, the curriculum had been the classics, but from 1313 um, until 1905, for almost the last 600 years of Imperial China, the core curriculum was the four books. So if we think about it, the four books um, have really uh, evolved in significance from being individual works to being part of the 13 classics, selected out by Julesy and published as part of the four books, and then ultimately being the core curriculum for the last almost 600 years of Imperial China. Um, so this use of the four books made it some of the most powerful texts in China at the time. And interestingly, a parallel can be made with um, what was happening in Europe. So in medieval and early modern Europe, of course, um, anyone who was literate had assumed knowledge of the Bible. Now in China, anyone who was literate had assumed knowledge of um, the four books, so much so that you know, terms and phrases in the four books were part of the common, the common language. So um, the four books achieved great prominence, but the story doesn't end there. From the late 16th century, um, the Jesuits and order of the Catholic Church um, came to China as missionaries. They wanted to preach about Christianity. They knew that they had to immerse themselves in Chinese culture first to be trusted by the scholars. So they too started to read the four books. They studied them and translated them into Latin. So here's um, one of the great um, masterpieces of their translations, um, it's in Latin. Um, and this particular text included the translation of the Analects, Practice of the Mean and the Harvest Learning. Um, this text was so well received when it um, came to Europe that it in fact helped stimulate the Enlightenment movement. Um, so um, you see that philosophers like Voltaire, um, French philosopher Voltaire, highly praised Confucius and Confucian thought. Um, so as a result, um, French and English abridgments of this text um, became widely available. It wasn't until the first professor of Chinese at Oxford, James Legg, um, translated the four books and the five classics that full scholarly translations um, of the four books in English appeared. Um, this is a page from um, his translation. So you can see at the top there's Chinese, um, you've got his translation in the middle and his copious footnotes. So today um, there are the four books have been translated into other international languages and there are various editions or, or versions of um, English translations out there. And importantly, um, the four books have become more important in China as China seeks to revive its cultural heritage and also for um, people around the world as they seek to understand um, what this cultural heritage is for China. Um, so the four books are becoming more and more researched and studied around the world. For us, of course, in terms of these talks, um, I think the most important thing is because of the time, of course, um, we want to just select out key passages. Um, so very famous passages, um, important passages that might be useful to us. Um, and then as we work through these passages, how will we look at it? The first step is to understand what the words mean, the literal meaning. So um, these texts were written over 2000 years ago. The grammar, um, the Chinese characters, what they mean, the semantics, 
are going to be very different from um, modern Chinese. So even if you know modern Chinese. Um, and then for us as well, that next step of translating it into English um, and explaining it in English, understanding it in English. Um, so that, that first step is very important to understand individual words. The second step is then to see how it fits in with the greater Confucian philosophy. So ideas like humanity, ritual, um, how does what Confucius um, said or, or did, how does it relate to his greater thought? And then probably the most important thing, the third step, is to think about its relevance to our lives today. Um, and our personal lives, our society, and then ultimately think about how it helps us put the guidelines for being a good person, the deeds of great, into practice. Because at the end of the day, all of us are really on a moral quest to lead more enriching um, lives and to help improve the lives of people around us. Um, and that's, you know, why Confucian thought is so important, because it really helps us to, to put into perspective um, who we are, how we relate to others, and how we relate to the natural world. Um, so Confucian thinking, um, whilst we, these texts may be um, ancient texts, but the wisdom and the cultural practices and ideas in these texts are so important because they provide us with fresh perspectives on our world today, but also a mental toolkit by which we can think about the problems in our lives and the issues that society faces. Um, and that's the whole reason why um, as the academy, um, we study these texts and we really put a lot of effort into delving into the meanings and then, you know, <clears throat> making it accessible for people today so that other people who may not have the time and effort to understand and study these texts are able to also benefit. So share these learnings with um, everyone else. So um, that brings me to the end of this first. Uh, talk on the four books. Next week we'll get started on the highest learning um, and we'll talk about um, first of all its title and then its opening passage. Um, so um, like I said at the beginning, um, please uh, put in uh, your ideas, um, your thoughts, your comments um, into the chat box. Um, if you've got any questions as well, um, please um, put it in the chat box as well. And we'll try to um, incorporate that into next week's talk so that um, everyone can um, get away and enjoy the rest of their Sunday. But um, thank you very much for um, coming. Um, hope you've enjoyed it um, and look forward to seeing you all again next week. Thank you very much.